Hello everyone and welcome back to Always Watching. Today we're discussing the new eight-part Netflix series Ripley. I strongly recommend that you do not binge watch this in one go. Try to take it two episodes at a time so you are able to fully enjoy the series for what it is. Briefly, Ripley follows Tom Ripley, a con man who's sent to Italy by a wealthy man to retrieve his spoiled Nepo baby son, Dickie Greenleaf. The series is based on the novel The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is just one in a number of books following grifter Tom Ripley. This story as well as this series has spawned a number of adaptations, the most famous being the 1999 version, The Talented Mr. Ripley, starring Matt Damon, Jude Law, and Gwyneth Paltrow, and the 1960s film Purple Noon, which deviated from the source material greatly. Strangely enough, Ripley was also played by Dennis Hopper in the film American Friend, loosely based on Ripley's game, the third novel in the series and this is something i would have to see to believe because ripley is supposed to be charming and innocent neither of which dennis hopper is but if you've seen it let me know unlike the films the series allows us to delve deeper into the psyche of mr ripley as well as the themes in the novel visually the series is stunning i love the black and white it creates a sense of tension and a sense of mystery i also really love the different settings in the series specifically the hotels like some hotels are really posh some hotels are not and every time the inspector tries to find either ripley or dicky he's either checked in or out as the other like it's really a fun cat and mouse game in terms of italy it's incredibly elegant and romantic like this is obviously an idealized version of italy like what you think italy would be like if you were to go on vacation like it feels very artistic it feels very just just like a dream. I also love the use of subtitles. When Ripley first goes to Italy, everything is in Italian, but as he becomes more fluent in the language, the subtitles are able to turn to English because he's become totally immersed in the culture. In terms of character, Andrew Scott's Ripley is a lot less charming and a lot more calculated than previous depictions of the character. But made past Ripley's particularly sinister and unsettling is how likable he is like he's an incredibly charming individual that will kill you if he has to whereas andrew scott's depiction like i i enjoyed it but you did get the sense that this man would kill you regardless like you do get the ick right away however like previous depictions i think andrew scott's demeanor and physicality like he has a very small frame like he does seem like someone that is innocent someone that could not hurt a fly like he seems like at face value he's not someone that you would notice if he walked past you let alone you know would look at and think that he would have the power to kill you before the murder mystery starts we get a glimpse into his life in new york he was a struggling con artist before coming across this job and throughout the series we follow ripley and we come to appreciate how much work it takes to be a con man and a killer like he's incredibly smooth in the way he operates and if scamming was an art he would be the da vinci or in this case the caravaggio of scammers so much of ripley's journey is narrated to us through the art and the visuals in the series the show makes a number of parallels between ripley and the italian painter caravaggio caravaggio is considered one of the most famous painters in Italy and at some point he was convicted of murder and forced to flee Italy and he spent his entire life just living in paranoia and fear of either being arrested or killed by his enemies. He had this reputation for just being very violent, being very just brash and it seems like this reputation like caught up to him at some point. So Tom Ripley lived his life in the same way in terms of paranoia. Like when we're first introduced to him, he's a con artist. He then becomes a killer and the transition to killer is quite is quite shocking because he really just doesn't seem like that type of person. But I will say as a scammer he's excellent. But as a killer you get the sense that he's barely getting by. Like this is not his forte. And one of the things I appreciated about the series is how you all, you constantly feel like someone is watching over him, like someone is breathing down his neck. Like we get shots of all this artwork, all these statues with different expressions on their face, some in shock, some in indifference, some in disgust, some literally looking away from him. A huge theme in this 
series and in the novels is this idea of justice like you do get the sense that someone is always watching and judging whether it be the god or divine like some like at some point what goes around comes around and i thought the series was very clever in that they they expose ripley for the criminal that he is but he's never arrested by the time the inspector is able to figure out that he's been duped it's too late Ripley has already moved on to a new identity and moved on to a new place. As an audience, we're not that upset that he gets away with it, right? We're kind of impressed even. And so how is it that someone that should, we should loathe and be disgusted by, like, how is it that someone who's committed so many atrocities, like, why are we rooting for him? Why are we so indifferent? to his victims. One of the most fascinating things about this story is how it never really forces audience to pick a side. It, it really doesn't pass judgment on whether or not what Ripley is doing is good or bad. Like is being a greedy murderous thief a negative thing? Is this a bad thing? Well, I guess it depends on the context. Because he's so smooth in the way he operates, you, you do, you're constantly in awe at the way he's able to adapt like a chameleon to the different places and to the people around him. Like he, he is so, he is so talented. In Matt Damon version, we find out that Dickie had a history of violence. And even though he likely hasn't murdered anyone, you do get the sense that this is a man that has gotten away with a few crimes of his own, but his privilege has been his immunity. Like that is the thing that has been able to protect him and save him for account accountability. And so when we find this fact out, in, in some way, Tom does feel like kind of a karmic justice. In the movie, it was a lot more obvious because he ends up taking on his inheritance. He ends up fully getting away with it. Like, it was a lot. And I think the story is quite clever in how it gets you to consider what justice looks like. Like, is it absolute? Does everyone deserve the same punishment regardless of circumstances? Is it rel relative? Does it depend on the context? Or is it karmic, right? Like, is, is, it, is it just... Do we just let the universe handle it? Because even though Tom is not sent to jail, he is kind of in a mental prison. Like he is forced to live in a, like live a life of paranoia. He constantly has to watch his back. He constantly has to be worried because he knows at some point he will be caught. His karma will come. And in a way that's, that's an even worse fate. So this man gets away with murder after murder after murder. So how is it that he keeps getting away with all this? And I think the main reason why is because these Nepo babies that he's around constantly underestimate him and they assume their money and charm is enough to control him or just kind of dispose of him as they wish. They almost treat him like a court jester. Like, you know, he's fun to chill with but when they're done they humiliate him and banish him and at the start of their relationship it does feel like a slave slave master type thing but of course as the series goes on as the story goes on Ripley is the one that takes control of the narrative and quite literally like control of this man's life so in the context of the netflix series you do get a sense that dickie is attracted to tom in some way and as a result of that he underestimates what Tom is capable of and Tom is able to kind of read read into that he, he kind of sensed that Dickie like Dickie does like him in some way I do like the depiction of Dickie in the series like he's not this out of control playboy that Jude Law was however he is just as talentless but I will give Dickie credit like he's definitely a lot smarter in the series than we've seen in previous movies and actually it's Ripley that gravely underestimates him because at some point in time he tries to convince him to take on a job for the Italian mafia and it seems like Dickie has this reputation in New York but this reputation is, is far from the truth and I think in, in a lot of instances Tom totally misread the situation and underestimated what kind of man Dickie was and in terms of why Dickie is in is in Italy like you you do get the sense like this man is not trying to become a painter like he knows he has no talent he doesn't even hide it like the paintings are so bad that even the inspector comments on it like I don't think that's what he really wanted to do like it, it's just very clear that this is not who he is like this version of Dicky feels a lot like very lost like someone who's really looking for something and it seems like he came to Italy to escape social pressures and just isolate himself like money at its worst can certainly buy freedom and in this case he just it looked like he wanted to go as far away from people as possible and I thought the speech that Ripley gave 
towards the end of the series, calling Dickie supremely untalented was super interesting because in every version, Dickie is able to figure out that Ripley is not, they never went to Princeton together. Like he's able to clock quite quickly that this man, they likely never were in the same circles. Although he gravely underestimates him, he is able to figure him out in some way. Like Ripley isn't able to con him completely. One huge deviation from previous versions is that Dickie is not working with Ripley to con his father. He comes to discover later that Ripley is kind of playing both sides in order to extract as much money from his family as possible. And I do like how this, as the series goes on, like everybody from the mailman to the literally the, the maid, to the hotel attendants, like they really look at this man like, you are really shady. Like we can't put our finger on it, but there's something not right about this boy. And I also thought the suicide, like the the plausibility of it worked very well in this series because again, Dickie did seem very lost and he did seem like very isolated. And so the idea that he would commit suicide after moving to this remote place, it, it did work. And I like how the setting did a good job of mirroring each character's kind of what's going on in their head. So when we first get introduced to Marge and Dickie, they really do feel like the only two people on the planet. Like they're living a very isolated existence. Marge is played by Dakota Fanning. She's a lot less posh than previous depictions like Gwyneth Paltrow. She's from a very small town and you get the sense that Dickie likes her because she doesn't know much about his world, but she certainly knows a lot about Tom's world. Like as soon as she sees him, I guess game recognizes game. And the fact that she could tell that he was a scammer or there's something not quite right about him, I think said a lot about her as well. The way Marge was dressed was also quite striking to me. She wore a lot of baggy clothes. Like she appeared to be very masculine in terms of how she dressed. And I thought the chemistry between her and Dickie was almost non-existent. Like they felt like colleagues and friends, more like lover instead of lovers. And unfortunately, because of the time period, nobody takes Marge seriously. Like she does try her best to get to the bottom of things, but she's constantly dismissed as just annoying or as a, just as a woman, right? And that, that that's very unfortunate. I was really surprised at the pacing of the series because we actually don't spend much time with Dickie, Ripley, and Marge. Like that relationship disintegrates pretty quickly. And most of the series is about the investigation, which I was so thankful for, because again, it does add this tension because we're watching Ripley literally get away with murder. So you're, you're kind of waiting for the moment when someone else figures it out. I would argue the standout character or one of like easily a scene stealer was Inspector Ravani. Watching the two of them was incredibly riveting because on one hand, we're watching Ripley prepare for all these meetings, all these possible questions that he could get. And poor Inspector Ravani, like he's always just one step behind. Like he really pounds the pavement, but he's, he's always close, but just not close enough. And I thought the scene between the inspector and Ripley was a bit jarring because it was pretty obvious that Ripley and Dickley, Dickie were the same person. And so I didn't really understand why the inspector wasn't able to figure it out. Like I had to suspend my belief just a little bit. And just before their conversation, Ripley is on his typewriter. When he gets up, we see that he was typing the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And this is actually a very famous typing test because it includes all the letters of the alphabet. And that's what the inspector feels like, a test. Just one last thing that Ripley has to overcome in order to make it out scot-free, right? Like he's always just like barely getting by. But I did think the scene was in effective in stressing the point that he is a criminal hiding in plain sight. One of the biggest changes in comparison to previous adaptations is, is the end. Towards the end of the series, we see that Ripley is able to scam his way into the upper echelons of Venice society. And just as things are going well, Marge comes in for a visit. Marge, like other Marges in previous adaptations, really wants to prove that this man is guilty of something but again she doesn't really have any evidence and i thought the scene when she found dickie's rings was really well balanced because initially this was another part of the series where i had to suspend my belief because if you found your ex fiancés ring in another man's flat you would automatically assume that he like you you would be kind of scared you would assume that these are trophies but instead she takes it as proof that Tom is innocent. 
and that he must have killed himself because otherwise why why would he give tom these rings like her default assumption is that these rings were gifted to tom and this was a really nice balance because in the end, it's Marge's novel and this picture of Dickie that she publishes in her novel that exposes Ripley as a scammer. So I felt this, this was a great compromise because it, it does lead to this huge payoff at the end. Like the inspector's face when he found out that it was Ripley, like that was worth the price of admission alone. The series ends with Ripley seemingly having gotten away with all his crimes with a new identity looking at the picasso that he stole from dickie and i thought this painting was a perfect depiction of ripley's journey so far so the painting looks like an abstract staircase and throughout the series there's all this imagery of ripley going up and down these stairs and it's becoming increasingly burdensome for him and of course this is a great metaphor because the higher he goes the harder the fall right like he knows it's coming but he has no choice but to continue the journey. So overall, I highly recommend this series and you guys let me know what you think.